Um, our presentation is on um, a, the use of an um, uh, atomically precise um, polymer system that, is, that we plan to license. Go ahead and advance the next slide. Um, and it has a whole series of advantages. The atomic precision gives us the capability of, of uh, creating molecular features that will repeat through the polymer which is basically a dehydration polymer, so it's fundamentally recyclable, and that any feature that we have in the polymer can be repeated endlessly merely by the fact that it is a polymer. Um, the, uh, one of the environmental consequences that we're currently facing, which isn't getting as much attention as carbon, is the acidification of the ocean. And so we're looking at um, one way to mitigate that environmental stress on the ocean by removing heavy metals and cleaning up the ocean. And it's not a direct effect, but we believe that it's both um, important and that this is a scalable solution for handling the kinds of quantities of water filtration that would be on the scale of cubic kilometers. Um, this is the basic uh, um, description of the, of the technology. The blue line represents the polymer backbone. It's nanostructured. It's got hydrogen bonds that I'll show you in a second. And the, uh, that directed in, in uh, of space, and we have um, in the ap epical positions here, um, 180, or excuse me, 60 or 120 degree, uh, 20 degree monomers. And that's what I would call the, the A monomer. So this would be an A, B, C, B, A, B, C, B, A uh, sequence, which is very easy to make in mass quantities simply by making a B, C, B um, oligomer and then polymerizing it with monomer A. So this is done with standard kinds of of uh, existing polymerization equipment and infrastructure so we don't have to invent the wheel and this does not require a, uh, the equivalent of a peptide synthesizer. Um, in the middle positions here, oh, well, let me, let me describe this. This, these, this would be uh, monomer B and it has a um, half of a binding site. And so while the polymer is in this configuration or conformation, there's an active binding site for a heavy metal. But when you take this end and that end and you link it up with thousands and tens of thousands of other polymer strands and you stretch it, all of these bonds here hinge freely and all of this infrastructure disassembles so that our ion binding sites no longer um, support the ion and it then can be removed from the polymer by mechanical force. Um, this green monomer in the middle is what's called an inverting monomer. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, next slide. There we go. So this is a description of the polymer system that we're going to license. And we have all of these different monomers that consist of, of a primary functional group, which would be a carboxylic acid, and a secondary group, which would be a hydroxy group on the acid monomer. And on the, on the amine monomer, um, there's a... Uh, Oh, I don't have it up there. Sorry. Oh, there it is. Um, the amine monomers have, uh, have primary groups as uh, amine groups and secondary groups as annular nitrogen atoms. So one monomer has a hydrogen bond donating group, and the other one has a hydrogen bond um, accepting group. So this is a biologically inspired industrial um, polymer. And by changing the position of the primary and secondary groups, we have both um, uh, negative vector, positive vector, and neutral vector. And we also have inverting monomers where the, um, the, the secondary groups aren't opposite sides of the primary group so that if there's a positive vector going into that monomer, you get a negative vector coming out of that monomer without having to change the monomer. Can we go back? One more. Okay. I'll go ahead, one forward. So this is the design for a seawater processing unit. And we're not necessarily going hmm? Thank you. Uh, we're not necessarily going to limit ourselves to processing seawater. Seawater is our scalable application. But 
We can look at um, screening uh, m you know, mine waste streams, for example, as an example of something that would be a smaller scale that we can then test out. And the idea is we have a chamber here that's floating on the surface, and then we have a float that's anchored to the bottom of the ocean, and this um, stays at a, at a constant uh, level, and this goes up and down, and that up and down movement activates the opening of a gate, well, actually, in this situation, the closing of the gate that's having the water flow through, and the opening of a gate there that diverts the content that's in this box into a bladder for later collection and processing. And then when that processing is, this has been flushed out, this gate closes, that gate opens again, and the flowing of the water uh, allows us to collect um, large-scale heavy metal ions. This would then not only include toxic elements that we want to get rid of, like mercury, but it would also include collecting gold and platinum and palladium and radium and ur uranium and thorium. So those would be our, our products that we would deliver. Next. Uh, one more up. No, excuse me, back. Two. This. So this gives us an example of how a polymer backbone can actually provide an ion binding site. Go ahead and go forward. Okay, so what, what do we have to, th as challenges? One is to design binding sites of a variety of different kinds so that we can not only optimize the binding of particular metals and elements that we want to get rid of, but that when the polymer is stretched, they release easily. And we could have 10 and we could have 100 of these kinds of designs that could be, that could be put together into the polymer. Uh, we don't know what kinds of biofouling issues we might have, so that's something we need to uh, investigate. Although the cost of this polymer is 10 times higher than many standard commercial um, polymers, it's in the realm of cost of things like, um, let's say, M5 or um, Teflon. Um, and because this would be a reusable material, in other words, it could be a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand different cycles of stretching and relaxing and stretching and relaxing. So whatever upfront investment is amortized over a very, very long period of time. The Japanese have d instituted uranium farming in the ocean. And what they do is they take these polymer-based collection systems, haul them up out of the ocean, run them through a laboratory, wash the uranium out, clean them, and then drop them back in the ocean. This particular approach allows us to do that in the ocean and leave it in the ocean. So the ship shows up, pumps out the bladder, and then goes on. Next. OK, so reusable. Um, the filtration process is reusable, potentially uh, tens of thousands of cycles. We can capture and recover the metals from seawater uh, and do re environmental remediation at the exact same time. Um, we don't know the ex extent um, of the ecological disruption caused by heavy metals, but this would give us an example of something that we could examine and study. Um, plus, we are looking at this as a possible uh, disaster um, uh, relief um, effort. So Fukushima, for example, that would release a large number of very large radioactive um, ions into the water, we could potentially put this kind of a system um, you know downstream of the, of the contamination, okay, and, uh, and do it. So we're thinking we need about a million dollars to investigate the, um, the primary um, technology to verify that it works in the laboratory, and potentially $20 million to do a pilot study, and probably um, a couple of billion dollars to clean up the ocean over a decade. Um, this is an example of people who have looked at App applications of energy collection systems in the ocean, um, CalWave, and so we would, uh, we would be one of our consulting partners. So let me stop at this point and thank the team and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you. Um, so you talked about the binding sites, you can be designed it to be specific. How specific can it be? And if it's not specific and it's capturing all heavy metals, how are you planning on sorting out the metals to sell them individually? Well, the initial effort is not to be selective. We want to pull all the heavy metals out. They're not used biologically. And so, you know, one of our ecological um, 
bragging rights will be that we're detoxifying the ocean, pulling out mercury, which has essentially minimal value. But the, the whole issue of the question of the, of the specificity is a very good question. And there's a lot of uh, modular design capabilities built into the polymer system where you have six-membered rings that have a 120 or 60-degree angle between groups. And then you have five-membered rings that open that up to 72 degrees. So you've got that 12-degree difference in terms of lengthening bond distances for the coordination complex. And you have any combination of five- and six-membered rings to orient the, the binding groups. So our program would be to build a whole variety of those, screen them to see what they selectively pull out, and then after we've collected material from the ocean, to run it through subsequent filters that will then pull out uranium and not mercury, or some other kind of selective process. So you mentioned biofouling. But uh, one of the biggest problems in oceans these days is plastic fouling. So what has been the experience of the Japanese in having their polymers coated in uh, ocean uh, repository plastics? <laughs> and that's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer to it. The original uh, notice that I saw was merely that they were doing it, and I never saw any kind of follow-up to it, so I have no idea how effective and how much dollars per kilogram of, of uh, uranium that they're paying at that, in that kind of collection technology. But I certainly know that if I had a ship and I was hiring people to haul these things out of the ocean and chemically process them and then put them back into the ocean, that that would probably be 10 times more investment than to merely com coming in and pumping out a reservoir. So I think that, that this whole concept is designed to dramatically reduce the investment that's involved. Uh, in yeah, if the cartridge continues to function long-term exactly. as you propose. So. Yes. Yeah. And there's also a depth issue, too, that certain minerals and certain plastics and stuff are, are, do striate themselves in the, in the situation. So it might be that we operate you know, 30 meters below the surface or something like that. So I think your previous slide had some information. You jumped over that one. OK. But can we? OK. Oh, let's keep it there. But uh, so one application is uh, one product you have is lead mercury free sushi tuna. Now that this is a, this is a, certainly a, yeah. a concern. Set up a farm in the ocean and clean the water up. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also if you were harvesting gold out of the ocean, you could make a line of jewelry, which would then promote the ecological. A con, you know, bragging rights is attached to that, okay. too. Ba back down to earth here. Uh, your <laughs> binding site geometries and specificities are great for a static lab environment. However, these aren't going to be in a static lab environment. They're going to be in a dynamic environment, a different ionic strength, different forces, tidal forces, and temperatures. Can you talk about what kind of variability you expect on that binding site due to this environment? Well, the fundamental part of polymers are um, Kevlar derivatives. They're aramids. They have immense chemical and um, temperature and uh, solvent and pH stability. It would take, you know, 250 to 500 degrees C and pH 12 to break them apart. So, from that perspective, this is a very very robust system. Um, in terms of dealing with uh, biofouling, we have no idea what that, what what it might take to to figure that out. Also, these are hydrophobic polymers that are going into the ocean, and that could create pie stacking effects. And we might need to derivatize these monomers with water-soluble groups to make them so that they'll stay dispersed and have a maximum surface area. So that's part of why it would take a million dollars to do the lab part of it, is we need to study all these different variables to figure out what's the ideal combination of all these potential technologies will work for us. Yeah. So yeah, there's a couple of points. So, I think that uh, you don't want to just use hydrogen bonding. If you want to take out things like uh, radium uh, two plus or things that are three plus, what you want to do is design in imidazoles, which can get protonated to stabilize uh, systems or destabilize them. Um, you know, mercury, the bad mercury is mercury two, not mercury zero. And so you really want to, I think you want to have some in mind how you design sites into your polymer that could be selective for plus two or plus three or, or plus one metals, uh, you know, platinum is very different, bonded platinum 
that's in that environment is very different than botting to, uh, say, a radium or uranium yeah. or something. This is all ionic collection. So we're not dealing with any zero, um, uh, you know, metals. Uh, and and it's, so we have a size constraint and oxidation constraint. If this is on the surface of the ocean, it's going to be highly aerobic. And so, you know, all the mercury will be plus two. Um, so it's an issue of whether or not we can meet the ideal bonding distance that's involved in a coordination complex for that for mercury, and and then when we pull it apart, is it now weakened enough that the mercury will spontaneously dislocate? And if we were building you know binding sites with sulfur, I would have doubts that the mercury would come <laughs> off. But because we're using um, you know sp2 oxygen and nitrogen atoms, uh, hybridized nox atoms, and their lone pairs, that's a fairly weak coordination. All right. OK, we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Steve. Okay. And yeah, with definitely. that being said, thank you to all you groups um, for this fantastic work and those like super concise presentations. I'm going to ask all the judges now to follow out Christine out of the room for deliberation. And while you're doing that, Lou has a task for everyone remaining in the room. <laughs>